Okay, things that live on the seafloor and above the seafloor. Invertebrate um, fossils are not everyone's cup of tea. They're um, the sort of low life. Everyone's interested in vertebrates more often than not. But hey, hey, let's start off with these. I find them interesting because we've got bivalves, these shellfish, and rather like um, clams, and these, these ones with these sort of nodes along here to stop them going down too far in the mud. They're very common in the Kim region at certain intervals. But bivalves, is a, the diversity of the bivalve fauna in the Kim region is not that great because most of the time, um, the seafloor sediment was highly anoxic. And there's only certain bivalves that can actually live in that sort of environment where there's not a lot of oxygen. So they're rather restricted in their species, okay? But that's not to say that um, the Kimmeridge clay or the Kimmeridge clay sediments on the seafloor at that time were totally anoxic, like a lot of people think, because here we got, there's a, a thing, a, a bivalve here called Pinna, okay? And it's rather like a, a razor shell we get today and if you go on a sandy beach say at Muddyford you'll see them down there you'll see the traces of them you drop some salt on their burrow and they shoot up and people eat the things well there's one completely mature living in these black shales which is indicative of anoxic events and so it must be certain times there's enough oxygen for that thing to mature and live in that environment for a certain amount of time before perhaps that anoxic event comes back in again. So we think it, this anoxia is cyclic. It happens, I can't say duration of time, but it happens time and time again, because more often than not, we'll find bivalves like these smaller ones on a bedding plane, you know, on a seafloor sediment, fossilized, thousands of all the same size, all dead, where that anoxic event has come up perhaps from the uh, under the sort of sediment and up through the sediment or maybe coming down through the water column to kill these things. But again, two inches or three inches above it, you'll see a repetition again and again and again. So this anoxia comes in cycles and it kills whatever's there, but it, life actually keeps going on and on and on. So they don't get extinct. They don't get, you know, they, they reform and come back again. Um, again, sea urchins, we get those. So there's a lovely sea urchin there with there with a little base where these thorny spines go on. So they, they actually burrow through the seafloor sediment, eating all the organic material. And below it, we've got just a skull of a fish, preserved ventrally, in other words, upside down. You're looking at it from the underside. But what's really interesting with this one, there's two round circular things there with little tiny spines, with little tiny echinoids. You could presuppose or suppose that actually they may be feeding on that dead organic material surrounding that dead fish. The other thing we also get in the Kimmeridge clay are crinoids. Now, in the lower lines, you get beautiful crinoids. They look like big sea lilies. They call them sea lilies. You get big ones. And some of them um, from the Middle Ice in Germany can, I mean, attached to often a bit of floating wood could be about eight meters long and three meters high. So they're massive. But here, when we look at these, these are just the stems of them. I don't know if you can see them very well, but they're very, very, very small. It's assumed that because of the low oxygen content, they couldn't, they didn't grow that big. I'm not so sure about that theory, but hey ho, there's there's all this colon and the stems, and this one here shows the the calyx, the head, okay, and um, that's really really rare in the fossil record. In fact, I've only got two of these, and I don't think anyone at the moment has got any more of these things. And again, on this block, we've got little tiny ophuroids, little tiny brittle stars, again, um, living in a certain level in the sort of sea, and we find those at certain distinct, discrete sort of levels in the, in the fossil record in the Kim region, okay. And things like the burrow. So there's a coral that comes from the Kimmeridge clay of Helmsdale up in Scotland, and what's burrowed into that is a bivalve. It's actually living inside the coral. It's burrowed into the coral, okay. And also what we get are trace fossils. So here is this seafloor sediment. You can see something's burrowed through and left that very distinctive sort of meniscus type um, trace. And again, very, very similar one there. In this siderite or siderite, this sideritic sort of mudstone, 3D of preserved burrows going through there. We can see the entry and exits of these here and we can see a cross section of the burrow. And they're very, you look at that one in cross section, you see it's, it's, 
it's very distinctive. And again, it's a trace fossil that has yet to be described. It's just being described now, actually. Here is another trace fossil, okay? And we think this is a mass mortality of little tiny glass shrimps. And all we've got left of the body impressions, the, the, the skeleton and everything is gone. And the reason that's gone is basically because just up here somewhere is actually a, a partial ammonite with a shell that's been dissolved away by the acidic seawater. So we, we, what we think is here, the, these little tiny glass shrimps, their carapaces have been dissolved away by that same acidic water. And the overlying sediment, which is there on that light one underneath, has actually filled their bodies and left these very, very fine traces. So there's a lot to be I've studied and lots of sort of um, still be gained from looking at actually the, the low forms of life.